it's a really a pleasure and a privilege to host our today world well speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Friedman. Uh, Dr. Friedman received his MD from Albany Medical College, where he also completed medical residency. And he received his PhD from Rockefeller University, where now he is the Marilyn Simpson Professor, Director of the Star Center for Human Genetics, and investigator at the Howard U Medical Institute. Dr. Friedman is a truly giant in medicine and authority in the field. As many of you may know, he has provided a substantial contribution to the understanding of the genetic and molecular mechanism that regulate glucose metabolism, food intake, and body weight. For example, he is a discovery of the hormone leptin, and its role in regulating body weight and food intake represents a landmark discovery that has a substantially contribute to the understanding of the mechanism involved in the development and maintenance of obesity. And indeed, the, the discoveries and scientific achievements in uh, Dr. Friedman's lab have inspired the translational research even beyond obesity, including other endocrine and metabolic disorders and even addictive disorders. Uh, Dr. Friedman's list of awards is impressive. Just to name a few, um, he was the recipient of the Lascar Basic Medical Research Award in 2010, the Canada Guardian International Award in 2005, and the Show Prize for Life Science and Medicine in 2009. And he's a member of the National Academy of Science, member of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Science, and foreign member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Science. The title of today's Walsh Lecture is Leptin and the Narrow Circuit Regulating Food Intake and Glucose Metabolism. Please join me in welcome Dr. Friedman. Thank you. It's really a great pleasure to be here and visit some old friends and uh, make some new ones. Uh, I'm going to uh, give a talk today um, with the slightly revised title shown here, uh, Leptin Physiology, Pathophysiology, and the Neural Circuit Regulating Body Weight. Um, and this uh, revision will give me an opportunity in part to acknowledge some of the pioneering work that's been done here by the group that includes uh, Phil Gordon, Rebecca Brown, and previously Elif Orals. Who, who, who really championed and made possible the use of leptin as a therapeutic. And I'll review this and other pertinent information in the first part. And then I'd like to uh, continue with two separate research vignettes um, about some new ongoing research in the lab. First, I'll talk about some unpublished, as yet unpublished data establishing the role, a role for the dorsal raphane nucleus as a key node in the circuit that regulates food intake. And then I'll also uh, talk about some new data uh, uh, establishing a role for the hypothalamus to regulate feeding in a particular glucose metabolism. And these studies make use of a new method we've developed that enables remote modulation of cells uh, using a magnetic field. One of the clinical manifestations of the circuit that we um, study uh, pertains to obesity. And uh, we'd, of course, as would others, like to understand why it is some individuals in the population have an appearance like this and others have an appearance like this. Um, and there are many different viewpoints, in particular in public discourse, about what might explain the difference between uh, these two appearances or the individual who might appear one way or the other. Uh, the first would be to suggest that the obese person lacks a level of willpower that's normally ev evident in lean people. I find that point of view is more often favored by lean people. Um, the second possibility is that obesity is a disease of modernity. It's a result of an alteration in lifestyle uh, and the environment that creates a, a predisposition to obesity. And the third possibility that's considered is that differences in weight are attributed to biological or genetic factors. Um, at various times, I've uh, taken votes about what people think is the most important contributor before and after I speak. I stopped doing that when fewer people voted for biology when I was done than when I began. So I'm not going to do that today. Uh, rather, I'll just point out something, which is that people tend to think of the causes of obesity as being one or the other of these to the exclusion of the other two. And were I talking about any other biologic, any other condition, people would immediately gravitate to the idea 
that there's a biological framework on which behavioral and environmental factors act. Um, and so I think all contribute, uh, but uh, I'd like to at least leave you with uh, uh, the conclusion, if possible, or if I'm uh, capable of it, uh, that there is an important biological framework that actually gives you an opportunity to think about how behavioral and, uh, and environmental factors might exert their effects. Now, there's a long uh, uh, list of, uh, of data that uh, would support the notion that biological and, gen and genes, the biological factors and genes contribute. I won't go through that in any detail other than to say that some of the most powerful evidence comes from heritability studies that have established that obesity is as or more heritable than, than any trait that's been studied with the exception of height. And this strong heritability or percent of the variance that can be ascribed to genetic factors is evident even in twin studies in which the identical twins are reared apart. So there's, a, I think, very strong evidence that genetic factors play a critical role in the development of obesity. And to illustrate the power of such genetic factors, I want to tell you briefly of a case report contributed by Steve O'Reilly and colleagues in Cambridge studying a young boy whose image I began by showing you. This child was of normal weight at birth but quickly began to develop morbid obesity in infancy with unrestrained hyperphagia. He was already pre-diabetic of the age of four uh, when he weighed 90 pounds with 57% body fat. Now this child came from a highly inbred pedigree, uh, which often suggests that, uh, that uh, the, the, uh, the extreme phenotype might be a result of a recessive mutation. And O'Reilly uh, noticed some features in common, some of which I'll share with you in a few moments, between the phenotype of this child and a genetically obese mouse we'd been studying. This is the OB mouse described by Jackson, at the Jackson Lab by George Snell and colleagues. Uh, and this animal here uh, weighs three times as much and has five times as much fat as a normal mouse, despite the fact that it lives in the same cage with the same access to food as a sibling littermate. Now, uh, uh, as I just mentioned, this is the result of a fully penetrant autosomal recessive gene. Now, I'd become interested in this mutation not because of necessarily a a priori interest in obesity, but rather an interest in the molecular basis of behavior, which, as you'll see, we continue to explore. Because you could also look at this animal as a behavioral mutant. The animal eats in an unrestrained manner. Uh, now, we had set out to, to study uh, these animals and identify the defective gene. Uh, I'll make one other point, though, that I'll come back to, which is that the phenotype of these animals is complicated and includes a number of other abnormalities um, that are not typically evident in obese humans. The animals are hypothermic, they're infertile, uh, they have immune abnormalities. In fact, they have abnormalities in just about every biological system. And there was no ready explanation for this constellation of abnormalities that would not typically be seen in an obese patient. And I think this set of findings led some at least to question as to how relevant this gene might be to, to human physiology. After a, an eight-year effort, we identified the defective gene in these mice as encoding an, a novel adipose tissue hormone, which we named leptin. And by all criteria, leptin is the afferent signal on negative feedback loop that maintains homeostatic control of fat mass. Leptin is secreted from fat in proportion to its mass. It circulates in blood and activates discrete sets of hypothalamic and other neurons to control food intake. If body weight goes up, leptin goes up and suppresses appetite. If body weight is lost, leptin goes down and increases appetite. And by this mechanism, body weight can be regulated within a relatively narrow range. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that leptin is the only factor that regulates appetite. It's not, but I, th I view it as setting the gain on the system so that by, it, ex in a sense, exerts a biological force that resists weight change in, in, other, in either direction. Other things might countermand that force, uh, but the force is there nonetheless. In the OB mouse, uh, there's a mutation in the leptin gene. No signal is generated that there are adequate fat stores. Unrestrained appetite develops. Uh, and animals become obese. Now, because leptin is a circulating peptide hormone, you can make it in the laboratory. And if you make it in the laboratory and give it to mice, here's what's happened. This is an OB mouse given saline. This is an OB mouse given leptin. You can normalize the weight of these animals with intraperitoneal injections over the course of about uh, two to three weeks. 
Why do the animals lose weight? Well, for one thing, they eat less. What's shown here is uh, an experiment showing that food intake goes down by about two-thirds in OB-OB animals uh, receiving leptin therapy. But the animals also move around more. Now, let's see. And I just want to briefly show you a video to exhibit this. This is a leptin-treated animal. You'll note that the OB mouse exhibits what's referred to as locomotor retardation. It sort of sits in the corner and doesn't move. Uh, the leptin-treated animal moves normally. This animal's been treated for a while, but it turns out that you can see this increased locomotion within a day of leptin therapy. You can see effects on locomotion even before you see effects on food intake. Um, and so this further suggests that leptin is doing more than regulating food intake. And, for, and furthermore suggests that, that locomotion is also under genetic uh, and neural control. Now, with this information in hand, uh, as I mentioned, O'Reilly uh, uh, suggested that the child whose image I showed you might have a leptin mutation. And indeed, upon sequencing and analysis of plasma levels, the child had a mutation, the same mutation that one of the mouse strains has, um, and makes no leptin. So here again, uh, uh, O'Reilly used a clinically appropriate leptin uh, and gave it to this child, and here's the result. Um, this is the child at the age of three and the, the child at the age of eight. These are the same two images I began by showing you. And I think these data suggest that what, uh, uh, what's driving obesity, at least in this child, is not uh, a, a, la a lack of willpower or a modern environment, it's a lack of the hormone leptin. Now, leptin mutations as a cause of obesity is rare. That's to be expected for hormones, which are poor targets for mutation. There are only a few dozen such patients worldwide. And so while we can say with some confidence that leptin plays a role in human physiology, it is not a frequent cause for obesity. However, as I'll also show you in a few moments, mutations in the neural circuit that respond to leptin are actually not at all uncommon in morbid obesity. Um, and this provides now a window into the genetic, as you heard from Lorenzo, for the genetic and physiologic mechanisms that regulate weight. Now, I want to emphasize that, that these children or, and, and adults who are leptin deficient also have a set of other pleiotropic abnormalities. These are similar to those that are manifest by the mice. And all these other abnormalities are also corrected by leptin. Now, how, how might we think of these? Well, the abnormalities include infertility, immune alterations, uh, metabolic alterations, hematologic alterations. And in retrospect, it turns out that these pleiotropic abnormalities are normally associated not with obesity, but with starvation. So one might imagine, based on what I just said, that if you're missing leptin, the brain interprets that as starvation. It stimulates food intake, which when food is available leads to an obese phenotype, uh, but it also activates a set of downstream uh, physiologic responses uh, that are adaptive in the face of starvation. Think, think of it this way, this child is obese because his brain thinks he's starving. And this line of reasoning, as well as some experiments contributed by Jeff Flyer's lab, has suggested the following, that when weight is lost and leptin level falls, it activates what you might call the, call the adaptive response to starvation. Some of the elements are shown here, a euthyroid 6 state, immune dysfunction, the so-called insulin resistance of starvation, as well as reduced reproductive function. In aggregate, what these responses do is uh, reduce energy expenditure in the face of this, the starved conditions. Now, in addition to the physiologic importance of, of this set of findings, this set of results has also suggested therapeutics, therapeutic opportunities for leptin usage. The idea being that if for one reason or another an individual has a pathologically low leptin level and one or more of these abnormalities, then restoring leptin levels to, to physiologic uh, uh, levels uh, should improve the, these pathologies. And I'm going to tell you very quickly two vignettes that illustrate this and mention a third, the first having to do with insulin signaling. And so the question here is, uh, are there states associated with low leptin and metabolic abnormalities such as insulin resistance? And the answer, of course, is yes. Uh, this condition is known as lipodystrophy, long studied here at the NIH by Phil Gordon and Simeon Taylor. This is the congenital or acquired loss of adipose tissue 
these individuals have reduced fat mass as, as a result oftentimes of a defect in fat differentiation, and this is therefore associated with a reduced leptin level. These patients develop a severe, often intractable insulin resistance with hepatic steatosis and hyperlipidemias. And it, it had been first shown by Shimamura, Brown, and Goldstein that leptin replacement in an animal model of lipodystrophy uh, could markedly improve this condition in animals. And this motivated Phil and his colleagues to go ahead and test leptin first in the most severe form of lipodystrophy called generalized lipodystrophy. This can be either autosomal recessive or acquired. Some of the gene mutations are shown here. This patient uh, uh, studied by Phil before leptin had uh, no adipose tissue, a massively engorged fatty liver with xanthoma, uh, xanthomatous eruptions all over her body. And after a year, a year on leptin, the xanthomas disappeared and the fatty liver had more or less resolved. The effects on the liver are shown here. Uh, gigantic fatty liver before leptin, correction after leptin. In this particular patient, some of the other abnormalities were also uh, markedly improved. Uh, despite uh, going off insulin altogether, this woman's HbA1c fell from 13.1 to 5.1. Triglycerides fell from 6,300 to 179, and her proteinuria resolved. Based on the response that was shown here largely at the NIH of this patient and others like her, leptin was approved two years ago now for the treatment of generalized lipodystrophy. That's the most severe form. It's not approved uh, for other forms. Uh, but I do want to suggest now, based on evidence that's also been provided by the NIDDK group, uh, that leptin might be useful uh, in other, um, other subgroups that are less severe. And these are known as partial lipodystrophy. And uh, partial lipodystrophy or lipodystrophy alliance has been formed now led by these three women all of whom have lipodystrophy. And I show this slide because it points out that you wouldn't necessarily pick out any of these women as having lipodystrophy based on their appearance, uh, in contrast to generalized patients where there's a distinctive appearance. Uh, in fact, Andrew and Gail look pretty lean, although if you look, their, their, their limbs uh, have very little fat tissue. Mary also is lipodystrophic, and she seems to have the sort of cushionoid appearance that a lot of diabetic patients have. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in the appearance of these individuals who carry generally dominant mutation um, in this cohort of genes. Um, and there's certainly evidence from the NIH group that at least if the, ab the metabolic abnormalities are severe in partial lipodystrophy, the leptin treatment can have a, uh, an important uh, response, uh, elicit an important response. And this begins to suggest, I think, that, that uh, or show that diabetes is heterogeneous um, and maybe that, that we ought to be measuring leptin levels um, uh, in lean diabetic patients to exclude the possibility that they're lipodystrophic. The caveat here, of course, being that leptin is not approved for this cohort of patients. Uh, but on the other hand, you might treat or manage these patients differently if you knew they had lipodystrophy as compared to other causes of diabetes in lean, in lean subjects. Now, one of the things that I'd been noting for an, a long period of time is, is this appearance of someone like Mary, because she's lipodystrophic even though she doesn't look lean. It turns out her arms and legs are, are relatively lean. And you see a lot of patients in the clinic who, who look like this. And I began to wonder, could there be a polygenic form of, of lipodystrophy, and could this appearance actually be indicative of that? Um, and I'd been musing about this for a while to no uh, good effort. Uh, when uh, more recently two papers appeared that actually suggest this is the case. Um, I won't go through in any detail uh, the evidence other than to say both papers reached the same conclusion, which is that among cohorts of insulin-resistant patients, about 15% of them actually have the clinical features of lipodystrophy and a polygenic gene signature from genome-wide genome -wide association studies that indicate, in fact, that there's a polygenic form of lipodystrophy. And this probably corresponds to what has long been described as patients who are so-called normal weight metabolically obese. And so I think the evidence is evolving that lipodystrophy is a spectrum disorder. At one extreme, it can be monogenic, recessive, or acquired and very severe. In the middle are these dominant uh, uh, partial lipodystrophy forms. 
And then at the other extreme is probably a polygenic form that overlaps substantially with what are referred to as the normal weight metabolically obese phenotype. And I think this probably has, is relevant also to the high prevalence of diabetes at low BMI uh, in the Asian populations. And so this, uh, this diversion basically was meant to say that I think that diabetes and metabolic syndrome is heterogeneous and that clearly on the differential of diabetes nowadays, especially in lean patients, I think one wa might want to at least explore the possibility of partial lipodystrophy or a polygenic version of it. These patients might in fact be candidates for leptin therapy, but I want to emphasize again, as yet the only approved use of leptin is for this severe generalized form. So that's the first vignette. I want to quickly go through another one uh, talking about the link between leptin and reproductive function. So the question is, are there patients with low leptin levels who are infertile? And the answer is, yes, there are. This is a condition known as hypothalamic amenorrhea. It's the infertility that often develops in women who are extreme athletes and are extremely lean. It actually accounts for a third, I'm told, of visits to an infertility clinic by women and afflicts as many as 4 to 8% women of reproductive age who stop menstruating. And of course, these women are thin, athletic women with low leptin levels. And uh, recently, Chris, well, not recently, a few years ago, Chris Monsuros treated a, two different cohorts of these women with leptin. And in almost every case, leptin restored reproductive function. And as I'll show you in the next slide, corrected other abnormalities in these patients that are also typically associated um, with starvation. So this clearly links leptin to reproductive function. In fact, several of the patients in this and the other study uh, became pregnant on leptin. Now, one point I want to make here is that you see, this is a busy slide, uh, but what you would see if you had time to peruse it in detail is that a number of fact abnormalities are evident in these women. They're the abnormalities typically associated with starvation. Uh, but uh, when you give leptin, these, all these abnormalities either are corrected or improved, despite the fact of what's shown here, which is that the patients lose weight. They start out with, uh, with this weight. Now, they don't lose an enormous amount of weight, but the point I'm trying to make here is that the sequelae of, of this so-called star phenotype are ameliorated in patients despite the fact that they lost the weight. And this tells us that it's the, le the low leptin that's signaling starvation, not some intrinsic aspect of the fat tissue or some, some other uh, factor. Um, the third vignette has to do with immune function, and I'll just go through this in a didactic manner in the interest of time. Starvation and leptin deficiency both cause the same set of immune changes. It, it involves a shift from Th1 to Th2 immunity with the susceptibility to bacterial infection. In fact, in the leptin deficient cohorts that have been studied, there's been a high rate of death from bacterial pneumonia. Leptin treatment in animals normalizes the immune abnormalities of both leptin deficiency as well as starvation. And there have even been some evidence uh, provided that leptin can expend, extend lifespan in infected or starved, in LPS treated or starved animals. And all of these data now establish leptin as an endocrine hormone, as a true hormone that in my view is acts to link change the nutritional state to, to uh, physiologic uh, responses in other organs. And I've also described at least three states associated with low leptin that respond uh, to leptin therapy, patients with leptin mutations, patients with lipodystrophy, and patients with amenorrhea. And I'll briefly suggest that there might be others as well in a moment. Not listed here, however, is obesity itself, and that's because obesity is not a leptin deficiency syndrome. Rather, leptin is highly correlated with body mass index or percent fat. And that's shown here. As percent fat goes up, so too goes up leptin, such that obese patients tend to have higher leptin levels than lean patients. This generally, when, now when you see a high level of a hormone in the absence of the hormone's effect, in this case to lose weight, it usually denotes an insulin resistance syndrome. Although you'll note here at any BMI, some of the patients can have quite low leptin levels uh, and they, as I'll tell you in a moment, might be candidates for leptin therapy in the long term. Now, the uh, studies of leptin levels and other studies I won't talk about have indeed suggested that in obesity there's some block to leptin action. If lep lep 
less leptin signaling goes on, you might expect an animal to eat more, gain more weight, and reset their weight at a higher level. And so we think that's um, uh, one of the pathogenic mechanisms that contributes to obesity, a relative downregulation of leptin signaling. Now, you might then ask, what good would leptin treatment do or hormone treatment doing in a setting where there are high endogenous levels? And the precedent for other endocrine disorders is the effects are going to be much more variable and less dramatic than in the leptin deficient state, in the hormone deficient state, and that's true certainly for leptin as well. And here again, just as a review and in the interest of time, I'll go through a few didactic points about what's been learned about the use of leptin as a therapy for obesity. I'll begin by just mentioning two points that I already showed you the data for. The first is that if there's absent leptin, patient lose, patients lose weight. And that if there are low leptin levels, patients lose weight. And I showed you that for hypothalamic amenorrhea, and the same is also true as I understand it from Phil's data for lipodystrophic patients. So to some extent, a low leptin level predicts a response to therapy. So might leptin be used as a treatment for obesity? And you might anticipate based on this that if there were responders, they would be the patients who had low leptin levels. Now this has never been tested directly, but uh, there is reason to think uh, that, that it's, uh, it's worth testing. And that's because there's clearly a responder subset from the Amgen data in response to leptin. 35% of obese patients show a 5% weight loss and 12% show an even 10% weight loss though it's not yet been tested as to whether or not this is this, this, the cohort that has lower leptin levels. However, more recently, Elif Oral tells me that she's been studying patients, obese patients who start off with a relatively low leptin level, um, and these patients indeed did, indeed did appear to lose weight and show some metabolic improvement, although the cohort size was small. Okay, it's also possible that leptin uh, uh, could be used after a very low calorie diet and there's unpublished data from Amgen as well that when patients who lose weight and show a reduced leptin level get leptin therapy, it does have a, an impact, particularly in men, on the propensity to, to gain the weight back. Leptin also has potential as a combination therapy. Leptin combined with a number of gut peptides has been shown to synergize to reduce weight in obese animals. And more importantly, a combination of leptin plus amylin or pramlintide was shown in a, in a registration trial to lead to a 13.7% weight loss in humans. Now this study was suspended and not continued yet because of a, a, a potential concern about antibodies to leptin. Uh, I think they've been, that, that issue has been partially but not completely resolved. Um, and so these data have lain fallow pending, I think, uh, a greater uh, set of experiences with with leptin as a therapeutic and a, a greater sense of comfort about its safety if a broader population is to be treated. Uh, so this completes the, the clinical review, uh, and, and that's because I'm not a clinician any longer and we don't do any clinical work. In fact, I did hardly any of the work I just spoke about. Hopefully I acknowledge the people who did uh, fully. Uh, we study the neural circuits that respond to leptin, and what we'd like to understand among other things is uh, What's different about that circuit in the obese state? What's the anatomic and molecular basis of leptin resistance that leads this hormone to have a lower effect in some individuals uh, than others? And this, of course, will require under delineating the components of the neural circuit that regulates weight on which leptin acts. And that's occupied most of our attention for the last uh, decade. Now, we've learned a lot about these neural circuits. Our knowledge is incomplete but growing. And importantly, the logic of the system has been elaborated in the form of at least two different neural populations that, that respond to leptin. Leptin receptor is expressed on two different neural populations in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, both of which express the leptin receptor, one of which co-expresses the peptide neuropeptide Y, and the other of which co-expresses co the peptide alpha MSH. When these green neurons fire, an animal eats more, when these red ones fire, an animal eats less, and leptin acts by inhibiting the orexigenic neurons and activating the anorexigenic neurons. So, to the, so if leptin is absent, these neurons are maximally active. These are off and you eat more. If leptin is added, these become active and these go off and you eat less. And the system is tuned so that quantitative changes in leptin level 
change the relative balance of activity between these two neural populations. Now these uh, pathways have attracted a great deal of attention in recent years, in large part because, as I mentioned, mutations in it cause human obesity. And so Mendelian defects in leptin, the leptin receptor, MSH, and the MSH receptor, the MC4 receptor, now are known to account for probably as much as 10 to 15 percent of morbid human obesity. This is an enormous number. This is a higher level of Mendel Mendelian loading uh, than for any other complex trait that's been studied. Um, it doesn't fully explain the heritability that I mentioned a few moments ago, but I suspect with increased exome sequencing and genomic approaches, some of which we've also undertaken, uh, uh, the number will grow. All of the genes that cause ob mutations that cause obesity map to this neural circuit to date, and there are others not shown here in the interest of parsimony. Now, one strategy would be the following. If leptin resistance is the problem, uh, one approach might be to try to identify nodes in the circuit downstream of leptin action, if we could then activate that set of neurons in a manner that replicated leptin's effects, we could essentially bypass the block um, and develop new, new approaches for therapy. And I want to tell you a vignette now that identifies such, such a node uh, that, was, that was identified by my group, Alex Nectow and Mark schneeberger Pane, using one of these new brain clearing methods known as, this one is known as iDisco. Uh, the other ones you may have heard about are Clarity and Clear. Uh, we used iDisco because of the proximity of Mark Tessier-Levine's lab, uh, uh, who is next door. And what this does is essentially delipidates the brain, so you have a scaffold of all the proteins, so you can do immunohistochemistry of the whole brain uh, at once. And here's just a, a, an example of this. This is a whole brain. Um, stain for GFP. This isn't our prettiest image, but you can see particular neural pathways. Each neuron expresses GFP. Uh, what's powerful about this method is that once you have this 3D mount of stained brain, you can make optical sections and look at any brain region for any marker you wish to look at. And so what Mark and Alex did is the following. They fasted animals and they stay not for GFP, but for CFOS, a marker for neural activation. And so what they're essentially asking is, are there parts of the brain in a whole brain approach of this sort that are specifically activated in response to food restriction? And if there are, we can study them. Now, one of the very useful tools that's available is software now that can overlay these images, in, the case, in this case, CFOS, on top of the brain atlas. And so purely computationally, you can take these data and catalog immediately which brain regions were, at, were activated. So they go through this, this exercise for CFOS. Uh, here's uh, at least some of the raw data. Here's the annotation. Here's the CFOS staining from the optical section. Here's a heat map that's generated. This is all in the control fed state. Here's the fasted state. You can get statistical data. And when we do this, two brain regions light up most prominently, the arcuate nucleus, which I just told you about, and the dorsal raphe nucleus. So what's the dorsal raphe nucleus? This is a brainstem nucleus right beneath the cerebral aqueduct. It's best known as the site where serotonin synthesis takes place, but there's cellular heterogeneity in this nucleus such that there are not only serotonergic, but also glutamatergic, GABAergic, and dopaminergic neurons. A possible role for feeding has been suggested by the fact that dexvenfluramine, which increases serotonin levels, uh, 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 is, was a component of the anti-obesity drug fenfen. Uh, this nucleus has been invoked as playing a role in many different uh, behaviors, including feeding. Um, we also noted in data I won't show you that the GABAergic and glutamatergic neurons in this nucleus projected to the hypothalamus as well as other relevant areas for feeding. And so we turned our attention to these two populations, the GABAergic and the glutamatergic subpopulations. We did this in part because of the following experiment. We just wanted to ask, is there a role for the nucleus as a whole to control feeding? And so Alex infused Musimol locally into the dorsal raphe nucleus. And what you can see here is a, is a pretty, pretty significant increase in feeding. 
increases in feeding are always considered to be significant because um, a decrease in feeding could indicate nausea or some reversive effect. But an increase in feeding needs to be taken seriously, and this is a big increase in feeding. So we decided to explore this further, studying the GABAergic and the glutamatergic neurons. And in the first experiment, what, what Alex did is sort of tried to phenocopy the Musimol experiment. Musimol is a, gamma, a GABA agonist by now optogenetically activating the GABAergic neurons. So a, a fiber is placed, the channel is introduced into the GABAergic neurons, they're activated via the laser, and here's the result. Food consumption goes up dramatically when these neurons are activated, threefold. That's shown here. Uh, this is one that shows an even, this uh, average shows an even more ex, uh, profound increase in feeding when you activate the GABAergic neurons in the RAFE. Now, I showed you earlier that leptin therapy decreases food intake and increases locomotion, so we wanted to test the possible effect of locomotion, and activating these GABAergic neurons had no effect on locomotion. We now turn our attention to the glutamatergic neurons, the excitatory neurons. We optogenetically activate them, and now we get the opposite result. In the window in which the neurons are activated, we see a reduction in food intake. And again, it's pretty significant, a threefold reduction. But in this case, locomotor, locomotor activity goes wild. These animals uh, treated with, the neural, act, with neural activation show a tremendous increase in, um, uh, in locomotor activity. Now, activating the glutamatergic neurons stimulates uh, or suppresses food intake and increases locomotor activity. That's the same thing that I showed you leptin does. So we next wanted to ask, what's the effect of activating the glutamatergic neurons in the dorsal refe of an OB mouse? And here's the result. Uh, marked re reduction in food intake if you do repeat the experiment in an OB mouse. In fact, the food intake of these mice is pretty much equivalent to that of a normal mouse when these neurons are activated. So it's not a subtle effect. Um, in fact, I think that's uh, okay. And then you do the same experiment, and you can also see um, uh, when you activate these neurons an increase in locomotion. That's shown here. And what I want to point out here is that OB mice show a much lower uh, distance traveled or velocity, which is how you measure locomotor activity, and you completely nor normalize the locomotor retardation by activating these glutamatergic neurons. So what these data suggest is that the GABAergic and glutamatergic neurons in the dorsal Raffae nucleus represent another node which has the same logic, it would appear, as was developed in the arcuate nucleus. Importantly, leptin receptor is not expressed on these neurons, so this is a downstream node. And the question then is, if we can activate this downstream, this node which is downstream of leptin signaling, can we get a beneficial or a therapeutic effect? So the question is, does pharmacologic modulation of dorsal refe nucleus glutamatergic neurons alter food intake and replicate leptin's effects? And so the approach was to profile these neurons to try to identify cell-specific markers that could be targets for pharmacologic agents that we could then test for possible effects on feeding. So we profiled each of these neurons using standard trap technology. We compare the expression profiles here. Uh, here's the, the, here are the genes expressed in the GABAergic and the glutamatergic neurons. And neurons that are off the line of, of, uh, of uh, the, the, the 45 degree line, these are enriched in the glutamatergic neurons, and these are enriched in the GABAergic neurons. There are known pharmacophores for each of these, and we've tested all three, but in the interest of time, I'm only going to show you one as an exemplar, the serotonin 1A receptor. So this receptor is expressed on the glutamatergic neurons. The serotonin, uh, uh, oh, I have the wrong slide in here. Okay, well, I'm going to show you then instead the, the result for the NPY2 receptor, uh, which is a different one. So this is a GS-coupled receptor 
Uh, that means it would activate the neurons, so you would expect activating the glutamatergic neurons to suppress food intake. Um, so Alex locally infused peptide YY, an NPY2R uh, agonist, and it should activate these neurons and decrease food intake. Here's just some EFIS data showing, in fact, that in slice preparations, peptide YY increased the firing rate of these neurons. And sure enough, if you infuse it locally, you see a reduction of food intake. We've done similar experiments for the two other markers, and they're all consistent. And so this represents a potential opportunity now uh, for defining chemical entities that may modulate these neurons and allow regulation of weight in a leptin-independent uh, manner. OK, so this, I, this, I think, uh, represents our efforts to further explore the role of the dorsal raffe nucleus in feeding. And the readout for this has been uh, the control of food intake. But based on the expression of the effect of leptin and lipodystrophy, we're also interested in, in, in neural circuit effects on metabolic parameters. Specifically, we would like to know how it is that leptin corrects these metabolic abnormalities, and we don't know very well. We don't know yet what they are. Uh, we do know that the effects of leptin in this setting, however, are central. And that's based on this set of animal studies studying uh, an animal model of lipodystrophy in which we compare the effects of leptin given either subcutaneously or directly into the brain ICV. And the simple point I want to make here is that ICV leptin in very, very low doses, doses that have no effect when given peripherally, have an even greater effect to lower blood glucose and plasma insulin in these animals than does a higher dose given peripherally. And so this means the effect of leptin to improve these metabolic abnormalities is central. We've done other studies I won't have time to tell you about also showing that these effects of leptin are independent of effects on food intake and adiposity and that it must be some uh, new mechanism. And so based on this, we speculate that leptin acts on brain circuits that then we initially thought would affect either hepatic glucose output or uh, glucose utilization, and we'd like to know more about those circuits. And the specific hypothesis we developed was that perhaps ICP leptin modulates the activity of glucose-sensing neurons uh, in the hypothalamus, which are known to exist. So that was the motivation for the experiments I'm going to tell you about now, which is to ask what is the biological effect of leptin or uh, activation of glucose-sensing neurons in the hypothalamus. We don't yet know, I should confess, whether, what the role of these neurons, however, is in lipodystrophy, although we're testing it. So to do this, Sarah Stanley in my lab made a new mouse, a glucokinase Cree mouse, and this is a mating of the glucokinase Cree mouse to a Rosa GFP reporter mouse. Glucokinase is an enzyme in the glucosensing pathway. It marks pancreatic beta cells as well as subsets of neurons in the hypothalamus that are known to be glucose sensing, and these can be in the arcuate nucleus, the ventromedial hypothalamus, dorsomedial, paraventricular, and lateral hypothalamus. So at this point now, we wanted to ask, what's the biological effect of activating glucose sensing neurons in different brain regions? And I'm going to show you the data uh, in a few moments for the ventromedial hypothalamus. Now, at this point, we could have used optogene optogenetics, which is what we used to study the dorsal raffe. As I mentioned before, uh, this involves placing a light-activated channel in neurons. When this channel is activated by light, uh, you get a, a, a depolarization in neural firing. And there is one feature of this that's undesirable. You have to put in a permanent catheter to deliver the light. Um, and so we started to muse about whether or not there would be a way to achieve the same end, but not, uh, not using light, but rather using another signal that didn't require a permanent implant. And we turned our attention, we meaning Sarah Stanley and, and I, Sarah's now a faculty member at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, we turned our extension to electromagnetic waves, in part because these are used in clinical practice in MRI machines cochlear, to control cochlear implants or pacemakers. So how can we engineer a cell to respond to an electromagnetic field? Well, there have been several iterations of this. This is version 4.0, but it basically makes use of two components. TRIP-V1 is a heat-activated channel. 
It's the target for chili peppers. It's in your, sits in your tongue and elsewhere and responds to heat. The second component is ferritin. It's an iron binding protein. Every cell uses iron, but iron can be toxic. So it's sequestered in a 24 subunit protein that detoxifies it and keeps it in the cell. And so the original idea we had was that if you tether ferritin directly to the channel using, we use a nanobody and expose it to an electromagnetic field, uh, it will activate the particle in some way and gate the channel. So we, we uh, needed a source of the, of the electromagnetic field and this is the original source. We have more sophisticated ones now. This actually is a commercial welding device. Uh, commercial welding is done by putting metal, opposing metal pipes, let's say, in this coil where a field is generated, it melts the metal, and you can then fuse it. So can exposing cells expressing trp one and ferritin to a magnetic electromagnetic field activate the cells? Well, yes, it can. In this case, it's a highly oscillating field, and we're doing calcium imaging. And what you'll see in a moment is some cells turning on over time as exposure, as they're exposed to the electromagnetic field. Okay, you're seeing some cells turn on now. We also found that we could use a static magnet, not an oscillating magnetic field for this purpose. Sarah went to the, the hardware store, store and bought a fixed magnet. And by pulling the magnet in close to cells using a micromanipulator, you can also change their activity. In this experiment, you see the wild type version of the channel. If you apply the magnet in slight neural slices, you can see a marked increase in the firing rate. And I'll tell you in a moment about a mutant channel Sarah made that now gates chloride instead of calcium and sodium, which the wild type channel does. And if you now wave the magnet over the mutant channel, firing stops. And it stops because in, the, because in that case, there's a hyperpolarization. With the wild type channel, there's a depolarization. So essentially, we have magnetic control of neural activity. Um, we continue to be interested in what the mechanism is. I'm not going to. Uh, uh, I would say for the moment it's uncertain, uh, but we're studying what the mechanism is or what the activation mechanism is, and it, it appears to be an interesting topic. Rather, I want to quickly advance now um, and tell you about experiments that test the system in vivo, now using it to either activate or inhibit neurons of the ventromedial hypothalamus. So in the first experiment, Sarah takes the wild-type channel. This is a sodium-calcium channel that induces action potentials. She makes a Cree-dependent virus and in injects it into the glucokinase mice. Uh, it's activated only in the glucokinase Cree neurons. She exposes the animals to a radio wave or the electromagnetic field, and here's what happens. Blood glucose goes up by 75%. In, that's in green. In blue is the same experiment opted with optogenetics, so it looks like this can replicate the effect of optogenetics. Now, glucose has gone up. Why has it gone up? Well, the easiest thing or most logical thing to measure would be pancreatic hormones. Glucose goes up because glucagon goes up. There's a threefold increase in glucagon and a significant decrease in insulin when you activate these neurons. Our interpretation of this is as follows. These neurons are normally activated by low glucose. These are glucose-inhibited neurons. They sense hypoglycemia. And when these neurons are activated, glucagon goes up, insulin down, and plasma glucose rises. We did our experiment in fed animals when these neurons would normally be off, but if we magnetically activate them, the neurons are activated, the animal perceives that as hypoglycemia, glucagon goes up and insulin goes down. I mentioned a moment ago that we also wanted to use this method for neural inhibition, um, and so what Sarah did is to make mutations into trpv one that converted into a chloride channel this experiment simply shows using chloride imaging that, in fact, mutations in the poor loop domain of trip v one can create a chloride channel, and that's shown by quenching of, of the floor by a chloride um, current. We now repeat exactly the same experiment I showed you a moment ago, uh, introducing the virus into the Cree-dependent mice in fasted glucokinase Cree mice, and now we see the opposite result a 50% reduction in blood glucose. What's happening here? Well, now in this case, you see a massive rise in insulin, threefold, 
and glucagon fails to rise despite the fact that the animal's been made hypoglycemic. So what this first of all tells us uh, is that uh, this effect is, is channel dependent, and that's because we get opposite effects depending on whether or not we use the activating or inhibitory channel. So it sort of helps to validate the method uh, because we get opposite results depending on the form of the channel we, we use. Uh, I think in a biological sense, uh, what it uh, suggests to us is that the brain can indeed control metabolism. It may do so in part by effects on the liver or, the, or, or fat cells or muscle, but that the brain also has very powerful effects to regulate the production of pancreatic hormones. It's almost as if the beta and alpha cells in the pancreas are getting their instructions from the brain and can almost be viewed as an effector limb in a CNS circuit uh, that uh, is down, that, that, uh, that senses glucose, activates neurons, and then activates hormone production. Now, I actually think that this is probably the main way in which blood glucose is regulated, and that pancreatic glucose sensing is a fallback mechanism in cases where the brain mechanism is disordered. Let me try to defend that, although I may be pushing it a little, a little too far. The brain is the main consumer of glucose, not the beta cells, and so the brain cares most about how glucose is regulated, so it shouldn't be at all surprising if it were the primary glucose sensing organ. Um, why then do you need glucose sensing in the beta cell or the alpha cell? Well, the brain, brain dysfunction ensues if, you're, if your glucose is disordered, and so you need a fallback mechanism in case glucose sensing in the brain leads to a, a, an induction of, of abnormal functioning. Um, why else? Well, here we're getting very powerful changes in glucose and pancreatic hormones just by tickling the brain. On the other hand, if we gave glucagon or insulin as an injection, the brain would counter-regulate. So I think uh, I think a case can be made that one of the main drivers of plasma glucose is based on glucose sensing neurons in the brain. And I should say that this conclusion is consistent with a whole host of prior pharmacologic and anatomic data from Steve Bloom, from Laden Vranich, and many other people. And it certainly changed the way I think about glucose control. So with that, I'm going to stop and sum up by saying that I think I think we've identified a, a new endocrine circuit composed of leptin, integratory centers in brain, and downstream targets that regulate food intake and metabolism. The study I just showed you adds the pancreatic beta cells to this list, and I'll simply now review what I hope to have communicated in today's talk. The cloning of the OB gene and identification of leptin has uncovered a new system regulating weight. The system provides a means by which changes in nutritional state regulate perhaps all other physiologic systems. There are several leptin deficiency syndromes that are treatable with leptin. This includes lipodystrophy, an underdiagnosed cause of diabetes that may be treatable with leptin. A substantial fraction of morbid obesity is the result of endelian defects in the neural circuit that's modulated by leptin. The dorsal raphe nucleus regulates food intake downstream of leptin signaling and is a potential site for therapeutic intervention. And then a nanoparticle-based method was used and validated to show that the CNS can control glucose metabolism by regulating pancreatic hormone secretion. And now I'll just simply close by acknowledging uh, the colleagues who did the more recent work. Alex Nechtow, Mark Schneeberger, and Bianca Field studied the RAFA nucleus. Uh, Sarah Stella, Stanley, Leah Kelly, and our collaborators, John Tordick and Jemery Sauer did the nanoparticle uh, experiments. And I think I'll stop here and take any questions you might have. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jeff, for this outstanding lecture. Please go to the microphone for questions. Please. Yeah, just, you mentioned uh, NASH, NASH, which is the topic of a lot of drug companies are going after that now. In a general population of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis individuals with this, what percentage would you guess you might be able to uh, treat just using your leptin type therapies? Well, it's not really been tested other than the subgroup that it, the small subgroup relief has tested it on. My view would be, my view is that it would only be those patients who, who had 
a high, a low starting leptin level. So it would be a ra rather small subset. Thank you. Didier uh, Shalhoub, NIA. Um, my question is about the uh, pleiotropic characteristics of leptin. Um, I was wondering if you think there might be some association between leptin and the musculoskeletal system as well. Leptin in the musculoskeletal system? You know, um, I think there, the evidence I know of that, that sort of addresses this is as follows, and it's in the leptin-deficient animals. Leptin-deficient mice show a marked reduction in lean body mass. It's almost as if all their calories get shunted into fat at the expense of muscle and also neural tissue. Their brain weights are also smaller. So I think there may be some developmental issues. To my knowledge, no one has actually ever studied leptin effects on muscle performance. There have been studies of, leptin, of, of effects of leptin on muscle glucose uptake, and I think there are effects there. Uh, although I think they're a bit controversial because they used um, some, some tissue-specific knockout technologies. Could this be independent of uh, hormone levels as well? Or is it dependent on hormone levels? Yeah. So I think what you're asking is if you were to raise leptin levels, would you see an alteration in muscle performance? Or mass, maybe? Or infiltration? Um, fat. So it's not been looked at carefully. I would just make the, the following general point. Leptin's potency is most prominent if you go from zero to physiologic levels. And if one were going to test, that would be the setting in which I would test it. Um, the effects are much more subtle if you go from physiologic to superphysiologic levels. I'd be surprised if you had an effect in that sort of an experiment, but it's certainly conceivable to me that there might be an effect if, let's say, you looked at muscle performance in OB mice before and after leptin but it's not been done to my, my knowledge. Thanks. Okay. Any other question? Um, I have a question, Jeff. How much do we know about ghrelin in the patients with lipodystrophy? Well, if the question is how much do I know, the answer is nothing. Uh, <laughs> Phil, I don't know, do you know anything about ghrelin in lipodystrophy patients? Nothing. Nothing. It's official. <laughs> It's official. <laughs> okay. okay, so now the while seminar is continuing with the reception, which is at the NIH library, that's kindly offered by the FIES Foundation. And for closing, thank you so much again, Jeff, for coming here today and for your outstanding lecture. Thank you so much.